Good morning. Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices. Uh, thank you for your letters and comments and questions. We answered them as best as we can. Our speaker today is Dr. Scott Ratson, who is the co-founder of Convince and who's going to be discussing a lot of information about health and the COVID-19. Dr. Ratson is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Health Communication. He is the adjunct professor in Columbia University, Tufts University, George Washington University of Public Health. And his other credentials are too numerous to mention. Yes. Dr. Ratson is also has been a board member of World Information Transfer for a long period. Christine will do a, a great moderated uh, role as well in, a, in our discussion as we've done in the past with um, uh, your students, your interns, your UN uh, meetings in the ECOSOC chamber all around. So one day we'll be back and doing this in person again. Uh, so I, I can just share the slides. Uh, if oh, the, here we are. See it now? Um, yes, I see the, the yes, Great. fine. So I'm going to go through about um, 15 or so slides and um, just talk about business partners to convince in a global workplace challenge, but also just talk about how we've got to a place uh, with SARS COVID-2 or now the COVID pandemic. And um, we all knew there were a, a slew of movies in the past, but now we have uh, you know, the reality of this. And this pandemic really is a, has been a, a, a pandemic of pandemic proportion. So in, in my um, world, we've always been trying to focus on what's the best way to get information to people. And uh, we, I'm on the board of global health at the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, we had a meeting uh, in last February when this was first breaking. And a few of us said, let's write something quickly that says what we ought to do. The evidence was clear. We needed a coordinated, trusted source to tell people what they need to know and do. And this was something that we thought could be done very well with not only a governmental group, which would be great for a government to support it, but a public-private interdisciplinary COVID-19 news bureau. Uh, and frankly, this hasn't happened. And uh, we just reprinted this article in its entirety again this week in the Journal of Health Communication. Uh, where we actually reminded that over the last year, we've not made as much progress and maybe we need to rebrand a COVID-19 vaccine information bureau so we could get information that's not just from manufacturers or government or intermediaries that might have best of interest, but a true approach that will inform and activate uh, our population. And the reason why it has a number five there is this was the fifth top paper of the National Academies last year. And um, I should mention that the co-authors, uh, Larry Gostin at Georgetown, the WHO Coordinating Center on National and Global Health Law, Naj Muschetti, who also was a, a fellow with me at Harvard Kennedy School and actually spoke at your last conference that you had uh, uh, on um, uh, the post-Chernobyl, uh, and now I guess it was two years ago, Dr. Durbeck, uh, and then a couple of other colleagues uh, in um, Ken Rabin in Poland and Ruth Parker at, at Emory. We are continuing to try to push this information along but while we know what the evidence is, how do we do this? And we began thinking about Convince with a series of dialogues that were supported by uh, Wilton Park, which is part of the, the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, and coalesced in a meeting that we were invited to with UN, um, the Department of Economic Social Affairs, known as DESA, the Partnership Group, the COVID-19 response, and the others that you see there at a high level political forum side event, an official one with them. And that's where we launched and had this call to action for convince. And it was after that time that the, the, we, we stuck with the word new COVID new vaccine information communication and engagement and began this initiative in a variety of places that I'll speak a little bit more about. This is the um, uh, how we actually have it organized as a coalition. Uh, and if you look on the top, of course, the coalition uh, has a mission to provide a forum and a clearinghouse for multi-stakeholder efforts to manage this complex nuance and immense public health challenge. So bringing parties together, 
addressing this in a world where society accepts and trusts the importance of vaccines to keep people healthy and the global economy functioning. We knew at this point, with do, not only Dr. Fauci, but Dr. Um, in the United States, but Dr. David Navarro, the WHO special envoy, all spoke that vaccine is the only way we're gonna be getting out of this. And this was as of last April. We organized in four work streams, the healthcare workforce where the Sabin Institute in Washington uh, and the Ariandi Labs with Harvard in Boston uh, is engaged. We have uh, media and technologies with BBC Media Action, uh, Translators Without Borders and others that are diff diffusing information and who are engaged. Community engagement, which includes a whole variety of groups. And then finally, the private sector group, which is this business partners to convince. Now on the left, we organized in the Venn diagram uh, where the centerpiece of what we're trying to aim for is vaccine literacy, giving people not only the knowledge and skills, but also the policy makers and the intermediaries to know what's the appropriate uh, policies to put in place, access, equity, uh, accessibility, and so forth. And the initiative uh, includes these three areas of the media listening and communication analysis in red, uh, which is the work that Heidi Larson in the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine has been leading, uh, the multi-sector engagement, which is principally the business partners, and then the message and creative implementation. And let me say that I'm proud to have been able to share the launch of this with um, Heidi Larson, who founded the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School, and Nancy Lee of um, Wilton Park. And we put that together in this way that then form this global coalition where we have um, business partners. Uh, it's in the middle because they're a part of each of these, but then there are regional areas uh, where Convince USA is at um, CUNY uh, in New York City, the School of Public Health, um, Convince Africa, we just hosted a meeting last week which included um, Secretary General, or Director General Tedros. Uh, we had a meeting uh, with Asia Pacific with the National University of Singapore and a variety of groups there and Convince Canada is up in Alberta working on activities. Uh, we're continuing to advance in different ways. And one way I'm gonna show is that we, we also garnered some evidence of why this was necessary. Uh, and we wanted to see you know, what data is out there, some of which was already generally there in terms of how people were responding to vaccines in the past. We uh, already had trouble and I think Dr. Durback, a couple of years ago, we actually spoke about that at one of your conferences about the drop off in measles vaccination and childhood vaccination and the need for people to get not only the knowledge of the science and the reality of this is how we were able to eradicate smallpox from the planet with vaccination and have nearly uh, eradicated um, polio, certainly from the Western hemisphere and a, a few countries are still you know, the last ones in on the rest of the world. But um, we know that we need to do this well with COVID. There's no other choice. So the first thing we did is we, we went around and we asked 19, 000, um, 13,000 people in 19 countries, a general population survey, which we later published in Nature Medicine, asked people plain and simple, if a COVID vaccine is proven safe and effective and is available, I will take it. Now, this was done last summer before any vaccine was approved. And as you can see, the, the numbers are not great uh, unless you're sitting in China or even Brazil. Uh, I say that because that's the over 85%. Uh, but the United States is um, around 75%, which has been consistent with others. But when you look all the way down at France at 58% and Poland, and even worse in Russia, and, and last week there was a, a survey done also that had Russia even below 50%. There's a big challenge on getting people to take a vaccine or willing to take a vaccine. And this is a term called vaccine hesitancy by WHO in or uh, elucidated by WHO in 2019. It was called vaccine hesitancy earlier, but WHO said it was one of the top 10 threats to society and top 10 included climate change. So uh, vaccine hesitancy is real when we started to look at it with, with COVID. We also uh, asked the question, what groups could do? And what we found most interesting is the business and community, people don't think that government and business community were working well enough. So the take home from this slide is, is yes, Singapore and China, people thought they were working together uh, well, but a lot of other countries are below 50% from Poland, US on down, that there was an opportunity for business to do more. 
and government to open up for business to do more. Then we also looked, would people trust business or their employer? And this was even higher, that people would trust their employer's recommendation. An employer is a trusted source. So we thought it would be important that employers get the information that would be appropriate to recommend. And as you can see, it goes anywhere from you know, in the below 50% uh, all the way up to 80, uh, over 80%. And then finally, would the employer also do the other activities besides guidance on vaccines on protect myself, colleagues and others at the workplace? And as you can see about in most countries, about half of the respondents agreed that their employer would keep them safe. This was, if we measured it against government or against others, this was higher. Uh, in many regards. So that was a good thing uh, that, again, we wanted to focus efforts on employers uh, and business. So putting that together, the fourth area of business partners to convince, uh, we started to write more about it. First, I had something in the Harvard Business Review in August and then in the Financial Times in December that business can make a big difference in ending COVID. And as you can see, I mentioned, you know, business partners to convince our initiative as we surveyed the 13,000 people in 19 countries that I just showed. But in most countries still, a third have no interest in taking a vaccine. And with that, we have to garner around uh, the, the efforts of communication to get companies to do more and to get employees and others to work amongst their companies and communities to do that. So we came up with a way, which I'll talk about in the next few slides, and then we'll get close to having a, um, a discussion, that uh, we thought the way to do this was not only to provide information. There's a lot of places you can get information, and information is great, but information alone does not change behavior. So we added the engagement part. Remember, Convince had the E for uh, information communication engagement. So the way to engage companies, we believe, is to develop a COVID-19 workplace challenge. And we've announced this, the next two, the slides after this will show how you can find out more and sign up. But particularly the challenge will suggest that companies sign and do this. One, listen to employees' needs and concerns about the impact and prevention of COVID-19. How does one listen? Does one listen just by uh, having a website Q&A, by having a, a town hall or a brown bag, or to actually survey their employees in a systematic way, but to find out what people needed and to actually continue to address that and find out what the sentiment is of their expectations that could be for vaccinations and others. Secondly, we wanted to make sure that people follow the scientifically driven public health guidance that is generally by their, their governments at either a national or local or regional level that they would put in place to protect myself, in this case, the people who sign, my employees, my workplace, my customers, and my community. The next piece is to promote vaccine literacy. That sweet spot in the middle of all of these efforts is to give people information, knowledge, and skills to make appropriate health decisions, to understand the role of vaccines in their lives, and for getting us out of uh, the current situation that we're in with, um, with lockdowns and restrictions. Um, so we wanna base this vaccine literacy on scientific evidence, explaining benefits and risks, and in many cases, even able to share the information uh, amongst a variety of different vaccines that are out there. Encourage vaccine confidence and uptake, and that means demonstrating the CEO, the line manager, the employee, I'm taking it, uh, we know that people are not having adverse events to levels that should be of a concern, nor are we having um, challenges that would, would say why one should not get a vaccine. So we want workplaces to encourage that, just as they encourage people to wear seatbelts in their car or to drive safely or uh, you know, not to text while, while driving or other, other activities. But the typical, uh, shall we say, occupational health and promotional efforts. Five advocate for accessible, equitable, and timely vaccination of employees. Uh, cost should not be a barrier. Certainly here in the United States, it is, it is not as it is covered by the, the federal government, but also how we can do this and help support that with advocacy in other countries and throughout the world. And then finally, engage with community, schools, faith-based organizations, and public health leaders to stop the spread of COVID-19. Vaccination is one part of this, uh, and uh, overall, you know, knowledge, health literacy, 
uh, the kind of work that all of us do in getting people to understand science, uh, build the confidence in our medical health academic communities are really key. And in the end, all of this is a trust building uh, activity. So how do we sign up? Um, business partners to convince.org. Uh, it's live, anybody could see it. We're just in the process of having a launch with business partners to convince linking with the US Council for International Business. That's the logo in the, in the bottom corner. Many of you might know USCIB. It's uh, official uh, business organization with uh, ECOSOC status at the UN. Uh, and it's uh, a group that has networks throughout the world uh, with other networks. So the International Chamber of Commerce, the International Organization of Employers, the Business Industry Group at the OECD, and is also linking with Business Fights Poverty and a variety of other national uh, chambers of commerce from Australia onwards. And this is what you'll get. It's very simple to sign up. You can decide if you want to have your name listed or not. Uh, and there's resources, tools, and toolkits, and all of the kind of pieces that would be appropriate for communicating this to workers. Uh, and um, you know, people eventually after you join will be um, highlighted. And this is just another picture of, uh, of what's on there if you do go to sign up. And then after you join the challenge, you see that the six ones that I just read on the slide are, have some icons associated with them. Uh, there's all sorts of graphics that help uh, business and others uh, advance this. And then the potential for using social media and other ways of getting at this. So I'm going to end not with this, but with a final slide that shows kind of the challenge that I've been starting to show to, to governments. It's, it's not a perfect art or scientific slide, but it puts what we're trying to do. We need to get to herd immunity. Uh, and at least the United States and other countries have been saying that it means about 80% of the world's population needs to be vaccinated or have COVID immunity to be protected. Now, if we have vaccines that are 90% plus effective, that means we need over 80% of the world uh, vaccinated. And you know, clearly you could, you could say ring immunity and some other pieces that get, get to smaller areas that we said this was just for one country. But for example, that herd immunity has that, that um, green star of 80% as the goal. Right now, we are on the left of this. We are getting an enthusiastic response where supply is an issue almost everywhere that the health and science and people that know that vaccination is important and have seen it work, wanna get their vaccines as soon as possible. That's where we are right now. In the United States, uh, in this part of the country, I'm speaking to you from Princeton, New Jersey, uh, in New York, we're about one in nine uh, people in those, those two states, New York and New Jersey have been vaccinated. So we're about 11, or so. We believe if the numbers are correct on all the surveys nationally and the ones that we've been conducting in New York at, at CUNY uh, and the, the global surveys, that about 60% of the people will be willing to get the vaccine. Uh, that's the, the strong willingness. Then we're going to have to work harder to get to that 80%. And we think what will happen uh, is if we don't have the trajectory of the slope going strong enough that people are getting vaccinated, worth getting back to normal and some normalization, uh, we are gonna have the impressional majority drop off and the anti-vaxxers that are organized, there are still people that don't believe COVID exists to the, the, the scope and the threat that it is, including whole countries such as Tanzania, to name uh, one of them right now, we are not gonna be able to get to the 80% that's necessary and we will not be back by 2022, nor maybe even 2023. And let me say of a, a meeting we had with Convince Africa just uh, a week or so ago, the, the African CDC was projecting that they will only be able to get to 60% by the end of 2023, even in the best case. So we really need to work hard to get to the number that we're gonna to need to get back to a world as we know it. Now, that doesn't mean uh, there might be other ways. There may be some other novel countermeasures. We might see uh, positive activities uh, that, that get us there, but we also have the new variants that are coming out that can even make this worse, that our vaccines won't be 90% effective or that the new variant will, will be there and won't have immunity conferred to population over a six month or one year period. So there's a lot of unknowns, but yet at the same time, if we go with what we have, we know we have to push hard and get the the vaccine enthousi enthusiastic vaccine or vac immunization uh, 
followers, we can say that, to get vaccinated, to get this middle wait and see group, to move from waiting and seeing to vaccinated. And then we need to, to figure out how we can help move these populations in different ways. So this is a challenge. Um, business partners to convince is one of those working in the workplace. The broader convince is working uh, globally with those other groups that I mentioned with the health workers and community-based organizations and the media. And we hope uh, Dr. Durback and, and I know you have other board members and interns and others who are on this call, all of us could work together of how we, we communicate appropriately, build a vaccine literacy and get back to a place where uh, you know, hopefully we could, you know, live amongst COVID and, um, you know, also address some of the other challenges that we face uh, beyond the, the pandemic. Uh, and um, nothing is more fundamental in, in effective communication and yeah. happy to be part of the, the group here to do that. So um, back over to you, Christine. Um, thank you very much, Scott, for, as usual, a very, very concise and precise presentation. Actually, we're talking about 80% herd immunity. Now, what do you see as the resistance to the vaccination besides the psychological one and besides the fact that since it mutates, everybody is concerned that, you know, they take a vaccine and it's not going to work. And we are seeing, for example, some of the reactions uh, that uh, countries are uh, talking about the reactions, the negative reactions to the vaccine. I'm not going to go through them because you know them, but basically, what is you, what do you consider to be the most important stumbling block? Sure. Well, well, first, let me start with the, the positives is that at least the three vaccines that have been approved in the United States with the FDA, as well as the other ones that have, have been approved by the, the European Medicines Agency. Uh, and it seems like some of the other ones with the regulatory authorities that have also met the level. Uh, we have uh, six vaccines that are, that are on the market, and all of these seem to confer the appropriate immunity and do not have massive side effects that uh, should concern anybody who is online to get a vaccine. The advice is to get the vaccine that's available in your country at this time. Uh, and I think that's a positive piece and we should commend medical and science and the ability to, to have clinical trials and regular, regulatory authorities at this point uh, that believe and have shown that they are safe and of different levels of effectiveness, but most people are concerned about safety. So that's the first thing. The, the second piece on the, the anecdotal, but yet, you know, anecdotes in, in our world of social media, whether they're, they're true, uh, so the whole truth decay, uh, as well as the, the misinformation that's out there is a concern that uh, one uh, adverse event uh, becomes uh, uh, overlaying the, the truth and, and the facts that are there. So we have to be careful about looking at some of these isolated events and Europe is struggling with that right now uh, when the denominator is in the millions and the numerator is less than 100 uh, to try to explain, you know, the 0.000, you know, 1% 1, 1 of these side effects that may be linked, uh, but they don't seem to be linked. So we have to still, the challenge that we always face, the same sort of risk communication challenges that you've, you've discussed in the past, even as we look at, um, you know, other, other, um, other past, you know, food or um, energy or other, other uh, environmental risk factors. The third thing I think is the biggest challenge is not going to be the new variant, although a new variant could come up. And if it spreads in it, frankly, if it becomes more virulent and the vaccines don't work and, and we have deaths that increase at a substantial scale, in a weird way, that won't uh, that won't transmit as much, just as Ebola, you know, did, didn't did not travel the world because it was an efficient uh, virus, if I can say that, of killing people. Uh, that once you figured out how to stop the spread, you know, it, it didn't uh, it, it didn't spread the same as these that have asymptomatic spread. So we just have to pay attention and figure out how we could get vaccines or boosters to get to the right piece. But the fourth piece, which is I think the biggest challenge that we have, is ideology. The ideology that has happened in the United States that I never thought I would see such a difference between uh, in 
it's been covered in the last few days between Re Republicans and Democrats, those who- Yeah, I read that too. <laughs> who it's, it's 20 plus points difference that they don't want to get a vaccine. They wouldn't want to wear a mask. They're less likely to believe that COVID is a threat to them. Though the ideology is, seems to be stronger than even now that we have the religious community is stepping up very well to say, there's all these religious reasons to get a vaccine. Uh, and finally, yeah. So you've got positive there, but it hasn't played out yet. Uh, and, you know, I've been quoted as others have in, in the press recently that, you know, President Trump, four presidents went on screen saying they got vaccinated and showing it. President Trump decided to do it. Former President Trump decided to do it in private. So, you know, we need to get if those are the people that are following him, uh, he's got to step out. Uh, if there are other reasons that are deep, we have to try to help figure that out. And unfortunately, you know, the fifth part of that, of that ideology are these conspiracy theories, the QAnon groups and the others that have garnered steam, have garnered legitimacy uh, by virtue of just the dialogue that they and the, the clarion uh, opportunities they've had over, over the internet and, and others. I would say that the fact that Twitter is, you know, working hard to take some of these things down and others, there's some positives, but at the same time, there's, um, some uh, disease vectors, if I can call it that, that are still uh, being promulgated over the social media. And nobody is really able to police that. And we need to hope that that could be policed with the ethics and trust that the, the platforms have a responsibility to do. Uh, but you know, that's in a process of, and a, and a long-term uh, challenge for all of us. And hence, your world information transfer title is as, 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 as important as ever. Thank you. But actually, it's, you know, we have loads of questions. But first, I want to ask Mark Robson. I know that you're on view. Would you like to ask a question? <laughs> okay. that, uh, here he th is. Thank you, Dr. Derbach. And hello, Scott. It's always nice to listen <laughs> to you and hear you. You're such an insightful and, 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 and interesting colleague. I guess the thing that I was so intrigued by was, I mean, the whole presentation was outstanding, but as you look at the uh, spectra of uh, countries where there is a hesitancy of, uh, what do you think influenced those people on the lower end? I mean, it was kind of a mixed bag. It wasn't politically oriented and it wasn't regionally oriented. What do you think the, the, the folks were almost at 50% or so are, are refusing to do it? What, what do you think was the motivation over there? Sure. Um, France has traditionally um, been at the low end of that. Uh, and I think it, I mean, I, I, it's a cultural element because it even starts to play out in Belgium where you have Francophone Wallonia, uh, a, a different bit than the, the Flemish uh, part of Belgium. So, um, you know, part of it is the media cult and the culture of, if I could say, distrust in, in government, not wanting to have things, quote, quote uh, done to them or forced upon them, you know, just as the, shall we say, the culture of, um, of, uh, of, of um, protest uh, uh, and so forth. So I think there's, there's part of it there. The other part, Poland was also on the low end of distrusting government as well there, where you've had, you know, uh, changed number of times. And I think the Russia one is, is particularly astounding that people don't believe that the, the Russian, in that case, it's even their own nationalistic Sputnik vaccine. Uh, that people aren't, aren't trusting. So uh, I think it's, it's a combination, uh, but I would say the thing would be tied principally to trust. We also just re-ran re the data set and just published actually this week on vaccine hesitant of the 13,000 people across the, um, the 19 countries. And things, some things really stick to saying that, you know, gender is, a, there's a difference everywhere that, you know, women still are more the decision maker are more apt to get vaccinated than men. Uh, so there's some other pieces there that are obviously we don't think it's biologic, uh, also age. Uh, and we think the age is related to uh, the fact that uh, an older population knows one, that the vaccine will protect themselves. They've also seen or know a vaccine preventable diseases, namely polio or, or measles or even diphtheria they may have seen in a lifetime. So there's, there's some of those other efforts, there's some of those other uh, places that are going on, uh, Mark. But um, yeah, you know, it's great to see you. I know you're doing a lot of thought on this too. And we, we always want, we want to ask the population. So we've done the survey, but I, I have another deck we're doing um, 
domestically, we have the Commonwealth Fund who supported us to do qualitative research on this. And we're gonna do a series of in-depth interviews amongst vaccine hesitant people or people that are not willing to get a vaccine to really figure out looking at um, but African-American communities, uh, Latino, Latina communities and others that also uh, test variably, and I say variably because all African, you know, the, our urban population in New York City is different than the rural population that, and we have both of those we've been we've been looking at. So, um, I don't know if that's the 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 answer you wanted to hear, but to say oh, that, I appreciate your insight. Thank you, Fred. Yeah. I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, right. so we're not going to be able to change it with any magic, <laughs> but we can we can work on it on the on the trust side. Excuse me. <laughs> well, hopefully, uh, hopefully, as I but. The, Personally, I think it's, we have so much dichotomy with, in the United States about the political orientation and people unfortunately are like a herd. So we have like a herd of buffaloes and a herd of uh, let's say sheep. And so depending on which herd you identify with, you're either going to do what the buffaloes do or you're going to do what the sheep does. And I think that that's one of our biggest problems yeah. <laughs> psychologically. No, but you're right. And it's, it's interesting because the herd immunity term only came up about, about 190 some odd years ago. Uh, and a lot of people, public health people don't like it. Uh, in fact, you know, Walt Ornstein wrote in the National Academies, we should call this community immunity. Or, community, or I use the word community protection. So people would understand, yes, we're willing to invest in a, a fire department or fire brigade because we know we need a certain percentage if there's a fire, we, that's community protection. It, similarly, we fluoridate our water or we have clean sewage. All of those pieces are there and getting vaccines also is a community effort and we're all members of it in that regard, not necessarily a herd that uh, also you know links to, as you just explained. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, I try to make it as simple as possible for the psychological understanding so people can decide which group they are in, what do they want to do. It would be very, very good if we could get one united factor for people, all of the people to decide that they are going to do something. But so far it's not happening here. But uh, we have loads of questions from students. So let me go and ask. Most of them say, thank you for such a wonderful presentation, which you have answered many questions. And uh, this is one question. Why did people from such take a form form such a position as not to take a vaccination? And how long do you think it would take for society to realize that it is important to get a vaccination? Yeah, I mean, it's, this is, it's a great question. And uh, the anti-vax people, if I can call them that, there have been vaccine skeptics since the 18th century when vaccines began. And um, it was a, the smallpox vaccine and you actually had, um, in that case, the faith-based organizations were more believers, Cotton Mather and so forth in, in Boston than actually some of the science folks. So you, you have just just a position at different times. But we've had since the 18th century vaccines and uh, we've had people questioning science. And I think part of why it's worse and more of a worry now is we had the dismantling or the questioning of, of scientists and institutions that we trusted, at least in the United States over the last number of years. And because the Trump administration did that and withdrew from the WHO and others, it made it very difficult to continue to have the normative and leadership status that would say why vaccines are, are necessary. So we need to do this uh, multi-pronged approach. Obviously, we all need to learn about why we're, a mom should know why she's her child's getting it on birth uh, and others, but yet we need to then also have the basics in schools. Uh, we need to build it where we have appropriate policies in place. So schools also, not only are students learning about it, but why they need to be vaccinated to be going to school and the school boards and the others to help support that at all levels around the world. Uh, then we also need to suggest of why this has to continue at, at adolescent and university age. We have horrible penetration on HPV, which is a uh, a human papillomavirus vaccine, which prevents or cervical cancer. A woman should not die of cervical cancer around the world, but they need to get a vaccine. Uh, and, and also for males. So we have those adolescent. And then we have what I think is a challenge now 
of the adult population that has not been getting vaccines, the 25 to 49 year olds, since they had childhood vaccine, they haven't been getting annual flu shots because it hasn't been re recommended uh, for many years. And they're not used to getting vaccines. So we've got, we have a, a faster uh, need uh, to give them the information to get the vaccine. And also it might be a condition of work or what have you. And our surveys and others are showing that that age group is in fact a, um, uh, a laggard. So I, I don't know if that answers it directly. If we go to the older population and we say, this will protect you from getting COVID or dying of COVID, and they know they're at most risk because those 65 plus is 80% of the deaths, uh, at least in, in uh, OECD countries, then they are motivated. But when you start to take it to other ages, it's not quite the same. So we need to have it tailored in ways that people understand. And there are some communities that will be more interested in saying, I wanna get vaccinated because I wanna protect my family and friends and others who I work with rather than themselves. So it's a solidarity message rather than a individual message. So the multi-pronged approach is individual level, community level, school level, workplace level, and then ultimately a societal level that it's a civic duty. Uh, and hopefully we can do that. Thank you. That, that was very, very clear. And hopefully everybody's listening to that one. Uh, there's another question from another uh, student journalist. What are the forecasts for the coronavirus? When do you think it will end, if ever? Well, um, let's say, say the coronavirus, to, to answer the final piece, that's to say it will be with us, right? We have a lot of viruses that are with us that don't cause uh, the health harm nor a pandemic or epidemic proportions. So we need to figure how we can get the, the virus to a level where it's endemic in society, which is likely where it will be, it won't be eradicated. Uh, and then we have either the treatments or the vaccine to prevent it. Uh, take HIV, for example, since 1986, uh, when it was first identified, we thought the vaccine would get us out of this. The vaccine did not, but there's treatment and prevention and it's now a chronic disease uh, as an infectious disease that used to kill you know, millions of people. Uh, it's a chronic disease, which has infected uh, millions of people. So we need to get the vaccine there to stop the pandemic, to get to the herd immunity, to get it to an endemic level. And then I think we will incrementally have potential treatments and um, may, we may have to have booster vaccines if there are new variants that continue to come out there. And even after we test the, the current vaccines a year or two, if people still have the uh, immunity, and I, I don't know what that, that interval of time might be if there does need to be a booster. Some vaccines, we have 10-year boosters uh, right now, uh, but others are, are less. Uh, another question. A lot of people believe that vaccination can cause a variety of illnesses. What is the right approach to prove the vaccination is safe? Well, I think the approach for safety has been proven uh, across the board for measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, tetanus, uh, HPV, meningitis, um, the list goes on and on. We know how to test vaccines for safety. And people were worried initially because not that many pregnant women were in the early phase of the vaccine, but the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists just came out in the last week to say it is even safe for pregnant women. And it's also safe for women who are breastfeeding. So the safety measures have met the criteria for the regulatory authorities and now the professional organizations at most levels. Uh, the vaccine is being tested on a younger population and the way it's been approved for 16 and above over in Israel and other countries and is moving down in this country down to 12. And I heard yesterday that already some, some trials down to, to six months are being conducted. So I think those will hopefully meet the, the criteria with the, the power and hopefully the outcomes that would uh, convince in those cases, parents that it's safe enough. But an adult should be uh, confident that these vaccines have been safe enough. Now, the last piece I'll say is I, we do qualitative work and we ask people if they will, uh, why they would not get vaccinated. And these uh, rumors are still promulgated that have been there for all sorts of vaccines. Uh, they're gonna sterilize, they're working to sterilize me. There's weird things now with this, you know, Bill Gates and the chip in my ear stuff that gets out there. 
But those are sort of the 5% of the people that are these vaccine skeptics, deniers, flat earthers uh, that continue to harbor these same pieces that are not movable. The 95% of the population we believe it is movable to get a vaccine. And we're gonna focus on you know, getting the people, of course, who are most willing first and the, the late or, or the late or the vaccine nevers, uh, there's, there will be some people that just are not reachable. And let me just say the final piece is there are some major contraindications if you were you know, allergic to other vaccines or you are uh, immunocompromised and, and having other medicines and so forth. And in which case those should be discussed with your physician. But for the most part, 99% uh, plus of the population, these are, these are safe and effective. Thank you. Here is another question. Are face masks effective in protecting against COVID-19? Most people ignore wearing it due to the fact that they think it's brutal to each other and even impolite. Well, um, I'll leave it up to any individual to think what's brutal or impolite. Uh, this is a way to protect yourself and to protect others. Uh, no, no way around it wearing a face mask correctly and keeping the social distance. So two arms length, six feet, two meters, whatever you want to use is of prime importance. We need to do this while the, vac while the virus is circulating and we don't have a vaccine protected society. If somebody says it's brutal and impolite, you know, we need to get over that. This is a pandemic. This is not normal times. The last pandemic was a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago. So I say we, we leave something at the door and we, we move forward and um, wear face masks appropriately and you know, figure out a way to make those face masks popular, make them easy to use. And frankly, you know, some of the fashion statements and other things make them more quote fun. So you do those three things, we'll have effective uh, health communication on this as well. Uh, thank you. Another question is, what do governments of European countries do that makes their policies ineffective regarding coronavirus? Well, I, I, I can't speak for all the European governments. I'm just trying to read the, you know, one, not that I have all the answers, but here's, you know, the front page of New York Times on Berlin and the situation with, with their vaccine uh, decision and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if I can still speak for the European side with the over 400 million people that have, should have access to the vaccine right away, right now we're at a supply issue. We don't have enough vaccine in countries to get people vaccinated. And the off and on strategy of letting people, frankly, the Europeans had opportunities to go on vacation last summer. Uh, there was much more free movement of people uh, amongst countries uh, and that brought the variants and the more uh, virulent strains to different parts of Europe. And unfortunately is why, you know, Europe keeps going from the uh, lockdown or closing down and otherwise. We need, I believe, you know, the, we would have a better policy if we had a pan-European, you know, piece that could come uh, be suggested. The European Commission was engaged in buying the vaccines and it wasn't only individual countries, but there's been an amalgam. And if you do study European, uh, politics and so forth, if anybody is, is if this is the question related to that, the European Commission does not have a large uh, competency in the health area. Um, health and consumer protection is, uh, is part of, of what used to be DG Senko, now DG Health, but the, the, there are more of recommendations and not necessarily policies or regulations that translate into each uh, member state. So it's, it's complex. Uh, I know the OECD is working on some pieces as well, of course, that goes beyond Europe. But uh, each of the national authorities you know, need to help coordinate their efforts. And even national authorities, I'm interested, example, a country like Belgium has seven different health ministers. Uh, we, need to, you know, we need to have that message. And that one slide I showed from the very beginning on the national academies that we said, you know, we need a trustworthy, credible source. We need it at the European level, we need it at the national level, and uh, we need it at the global level. And uh, unfortunately, I think there's still the parts that miss around and vaccine nationalism and vaccine diplomacy are getting in the way of prudent health uh, policy making. Uh, do you have any idea 
what has caused WHO to lose its effectiveness? It used to be that it had much more influence. Um, do you do you have any ideas why this has happened? Well, I mean, the World Health Organization, uh, you know, sets the, the norms, the nor it's normative guidance. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a member, it's a, it's 190 plus member states, depending where you are with a couple. Uh, and it's important to have all of them. And I mean, look at if what's one, one wants to look at success in looking at COVID, we should look at what Taiwan's been doing. Uh, yeah. And part of the way I say that is they have observer status at the WHO, but are very important to learn if there are uh, viruses and so forth. And we learn some pieces from SARS and we learn from others. Uh, unfortunately, these organizations, while it is important to have good leadership and you know, member state driven activities, they, they're resourced uh, in, in different ways that make it difficult in some cases to advance um, advance prudent policy quickly. So it took a little while to get the public health emergency of international concern last February announced. There were questions of what was going on in China. And then you had the unfortunate aspect of a big member state like the United States questioning the WHO, attacking yes. the trustworthy nature of global institutions. So we've when we have that happen, it has consequences. And it matters. So we have to rebuild that trust at WHO. Frankly, the UN organizations as well need that. The business organizations, all the global institutions have been under threat. And even now we're seeing it with the diplomatic piece of, we can't go to WHO. So we create these other public private partnerships like Gabi, which does for, for vaccines or CEPI coalition for epidemic preparedness innovation. And now you have even for, you know, the quad, which has been called in the last week with Australia, India, Japan, and the US working on, uh, on vaccine and health issues there. So uh, the answer is trust has been going down. The other part is there, because there are resources that were even being pulled away like the US and others that have been coming in from Gates Foundation and others to just sponsor programs and implementation pieces, we may have lost some of the, the strength and, the, and the, um, the trustworthy voice that we need. We can rebuild it just, I, you know, frankly, the CDC lost some credibility uh, during the Ebola piece. They rebuilt it back up. It's got hit again over the last administration. The new administration is working to, to rebuild that. And um, I, you know, CDC and the, the two best agencies in the United States government on the trend were the science ones, NASA, uh, and CDC, so we, and then NIH, all three of those, I give them credit together. So we need to, we need to build the science and medicine and um, get that back with WHO as well. Uh, you know that the uh, World Economic Forum is going to be taking place in Singapore in August. And the main topic is going to be COVID. Are you planning to attend this? Are you presenting there? Oh, that's <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. That I I work uh, I I actually with Arnold Bernard, another the physician at WHO. We did a virtual uh, wasn't called Virtual Voices. I'm not WHO World Economic Forum. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, right. We 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 did one of these kind of pieces a few weeks ago. Uh, I I'm not certain of what their program is yet, but I would say our business partners to convince at least in the the Zoom meeting that we had and it's archived. Uh, he's very spoke highly of convince and wanting to work together. We do have um, the World Economic Forum on our business partners to convince steering group. Uh, and we look forward to working with all organizations in this regard. Similarly, I did something with the International Organization of Employers a couple of weeks ago, which included the ILO, Guy Ryder, who's the director general there. And um, Dr. Tedros also participated in the importance of, of business and employers. So we do want to, to do that. And all of these events hopefully will help build the momentum and whoever is asking that. Um, I'm happy to engage if it if it works out. Well, uh, I will talk to you about that afterwards. But we have a, here we have another question from um, one of the students. A lot of people believe that vaccination can cause a variety of illnesses. What is the right way to prove the vaccination is safe and who should do it? Well, you know, to go back, the question keeps going to prove. Uh, I think the proof is in the history that we know. Uh, I have the numbers of vaccine preventable childhood illness has probably been in the last century 
there are two key areas that have increased longevity around the world. One are vaccinations, one we eliminated smallpox and, and mentioned the polio situation. The second piece, which is fewer people are dying of measles. A lot of people used to, well, still, unfortunately, thousands are dying of measles, but vaccines have prevented that as diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, and so forth. That's the number one. The second piece that's made the difference in the last century is women's education. Educating women, one, it brings them out, it helps bring them out of poverty, but two, it gives better health for themselves and their families. Women are still the prime decision maker. So take your vaccine question. Women know and should trust the science and medicine, and they do in developing countries, more in lower income countries. They're, we don't have the vaccine refusers on measles, mumps and rubella there. The MMR vaccines stem from the United Kingdom and then the US and then others. Then we had HPV, which was questioned in the Philippines and Colombia and Japan and some countries are also uh, against that. These vaccines have been proven to be safe and effective. There are side effects and adverse events that happen in an infinitesimal approach. And in the United States, and they have a, a whole a fund for that if there is an adverse event but other countries also treat that similarly. So I, I know that you said it was a question from a student. I think the proof is there. Uh, now this, the, the causality and all these other pieces that might have been uh, questioned in the past of using preservatives like thimerosal, which we use for multi-dose viral vials of the UNICEF polio vaccine that was given around the world. We got rid of polio and the thimerosal did not cause problems. We need to get uh, beyond and think of the consequences of questioning this crazy theory that has never been supported nor proven of autism related to vaccination. And yeah. that just has to be put to rest. The National Academies has put this to rest. We spend millions to prove something that never should have even made its way into the peer-reviewed literature, nor into the psyche of many people. And it's just the reality of our world right now. Just like, why do we have to create a virus that would be a computer virus? Think about it, another human created element that, so, you know, there's lots of challenges, uh, but hopefully that answered the question if we just took historically and the, the millions or if not billions of people who've been, uh, have lives that have been um, better because of um, vaccination. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned the, uh, the point with autism and vaccine. Uh, but as you know, there was a lot of political influence on that one. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the politicians, the political side, which had nothing to do with reality except a personal reaction uh, of basically taking psychotropic drugs when you're pregnant, which does cause and certain uh, women autism. But anyway, we have another question here. Uh, Dr. Raxon, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Can today's corona uh, virus be compared to a medieval, medieval plague and smallpox of the 19th century as a disease of the era? You already pretty much answered that. In this case, is vaccination the only salvation for the people? What about people with vaccine incompatibility or allergies to it? Well, you know, the, the whole, I thank you for the question and I know we're, we're getting close to the end here. So just in short, to get to herd immunity doesn't mean every single person has to be vaccinated. That's why we need everybody for measles. If there's a, a child who can't get the vaccine for the kind of reasons that you mentioned, uh, if almost everyone else in the school is vaccinated and the, the small percent that are immunocompromised or allergic or not, they are protected by this, this herd immunity theory. So the goal should be to get as many people that can and those outliers, you know, maybe there will be another vaccine or something else that could help prevent if it is still endemic in society. But uh, the vaccine is the only way out of it from what we have right now. And we should do everything to promote that. And uh, on a case by case basis, there may be more uh, information in the future that would even the people that you're mentioning will be eligible for vaccination. But right now they should follow the, the medical advice and, and the, um, the authorities if there are in that, that small subset. Uh, another question, how likely are children to catch or transmit the virus in school settings or homes? Well, it seems to be, uh, well, the, the, when you add or homes, uh, 
the second part, anybody who has close contact without a mask, um, with less than two meters, without air being circulated, all these, you know, a lot of other variables, yes, it's, um, they're more apt to get it. Schools then, some of them have the other uh, mask wearing, separation, distancing, and so forth. But it does seem to be, it is transmittable still. And the, the challenge is not just for the students, but also for the teachers that go back to the community and go to other places. And also the nature of schools of different ages with sports and intermingling, it's a lot of other community spread. So you have to have the appropriate epidemiological study to do that, but we do know that it can be spread and um, we have to take the right measures in place, uh, but also work to get people vaccinated and then it won't, it will be more of a moot question at some point. Another question, can you say something about the different strains of coronavirus and what causes the mutation? Well, I mean, that's a, probably a, a long question, but as a, a long answer that I, yeah, I'm not the probably the right person even to answer all of it, other than the more that the virus circulates in society, there's a more opportunity for there to be some mutation. Some mutations are don't matter at all to humankind. I mean, they're there and the virus is just mutating, but after a point, if it gets more virulent and then we give these numbers and names by virtue of where they are on the, um, on the RNA or DNA or or whichever part we're looking at, uh, that we give them numbers and names. So they, they tend to be clustered in different spots. Hence, there's we've already California, we're talking about New York, Brazil, South Africa. These are countries that have had you know, uh, a lot of virus circulating around. So if we get less virus circulated around, which means more people are vaccinated and protected, there will be less variants just by definition. We gotta approach the denominator that will, will, approach, will affect the numerator. That should be our, our strategy. And this is pertaining to this. Is there a suggestion on how we can make society believe the vaccination is really effective and how can that be implemented? We could do that by people seeing vaccinated people, not going to the hospital, uh, not getting infected, able to, to go back to having you know, events, 12, 20 people that are vaccinated without masks, without anybody getting sick a day or a week or a month later. We have to demonstrate it that way. We, we know that it's, it's, it does that. It's already been tested in the clinical trials and early on people are, are having that, but that's how people will know. They'll see others like themselves and, and we'll see numbers of hospitals, hospitalization going down. We'll see eventually the death, death rate going down. That's what people will need to see. Uh, and we need to communicate that daily. We need to put the positive stuff on there uh, as well as remind people that if you don't, you can, can still, uh, you can still die from this disease. This is not an innocuous uh, common cold. Thank you very, very much for a wonderful presentation. You definitely are a wonderful, how should I say, professor. You teach very well. And the most important thing is you're interested in continuing expanding what you know and sharing it with not only students, but also politicians and leaders. So thank you. Take good care of yourself and we'll talk soon. Thank you. You too. And everyone stay well and please get vaccinated when you're eligible and um, spread the word positively. We will get out of this pandemic and we will have a, a better world with all of the work that we're all trying to do. So thank you, Christine, uh, Dr. Durback, uh, World Information Transfer, all the work you've been doing and will continue to. But please be part of this. I wish you one of the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.